This episode of Basics with Babish is sponsored by Bright Cellars, a monthly wine club that matches you with wine you'll love and delivers it right to your door. It's easy, convenient, and the bottles you receive are personalized to your taste preferences. Bright Cellars is offering you 50% off your first six bottle box plus a bonus bottle. That's seven bottles total. So follow the link in the video description to take the quiz and get started. Now let's get down to basics. All right, so this week on Basics, I'm super excited to share that Sawyer, who you all know and love, just became a father. So as many new parents have told me, he's gonna need a lot of quick and easy heat and eat meals. So we're doing just that, frozen breakfasts, lunches, and dinners that are literally going straight to his house as soon as we're done filming. First up, as you can see, I've got a half dozen English muffins here that I am splitting and placing on a wire rack set in a ribbon baking sheet, which we're gonna toast for five to 10 minutes in a 350 degree Fahrenheit oven, both because untoasted English muffins just kind of taste weird and because more Moisture is the enemy of the freezer. As you may have guessed, we're making breakfast sandwiches, so we need some eggs. And just to be cute, I want to make my eggs into perfectly round patties. So I'm going to heat some butter over medium heat in a non-stick saute pan and lightly beat an egg in a small bowl. Then I've got a stainless steel ring mold, the exact width of my English muffins that I'm going to place right down in the butter, pour my lightly beaten egg inside, continue to lightly beat it. You want to keep it moving until it's mostly set, that way it doesn't sear on one side and end up raw on the other. Then once it's pretty much done, we're going to scrape around the outside of the egg to separate it from the ring mold, pop it on out, give it a flip to make sure that it's cooked all the way around, and set it aside to cool completely while we whip up six more. I'm probably going to end up saying this a lot this episode, but you want to make sure that everything is cooled at least to room temperature before assembling, fridging, or freezing anything. So now that our English muffins are lightly toasted and likewise cooled, we can start assembling. I'm going with a slice of cheddar on the bottom, our egg patty, a slice of Canadian bacon, and another slice of cheddar. Putting cheese on each side of the muffin insulates it from any moisture that's given off by the eggs or ham during the reheating process, which should hopefully help reduce soggage. Next up, we gotta wrap these guys for the freezer. This can either be accomplished by virtue of parchment paper or plastic wrap, followed by a layer of aluminum foil. The idea here is to reduce freezer burn as much as possible. Once you've got everybody wrapped and labeled, they're headed into the freezer, where you can keep them for up to two months. You can reheat them either by wrapping them in a moist paper towel and microwaving on medium power for two minutes, or taking off the parchment paper and rewrapping them in the foil and baking at 350 degrees. Fahrenheit for 20 to 30 minutes. Next up, some big bad breakfast burritos. I plan on making about a half dozen of these and each one requires about two eggs, so I'm cracking 14 into a large bowl and beating together. Yes, I know that's too, too many. I'd rather have too much than too little. Nothing is sadder than an underfilled breakfast burrito. And to cook set eggs, I'm going to melt two tablespoons of butter in a large nonstick saute pan, heat over medium until foaming, add the eggs, and slowly and infrequently move them around. I'm looking for those your dad on a Sunday morning hotel continental breakfast kind of eggs. Big, fluffy, firm curds that are going to help give structure to our breakfast burritos. And then since these are going to be sort of kind of healthier than the breakfast sandwiches, I'm going to make a sautéed onion and wilted charred filling. So I got one large Spanish onion that I'm going to finely chop. Then I've got some rinsed and dried Swiss chard, the leaves of which I'm going to start removing from the brightly colored stems. I'm going to roughly chop the leaves and you could thinly slice the stems and keep them in there, but they're very earthy tasting. So I only recommend it if you really like the taste of chard. We're heating a tablespoon or two of vegetable oil in a large saute pan, about one minute or until shimmering, adding our onion and sauteing for three to five minutes until they just start to sweat and soften. Then once they got a little color and they're looking nice and soft, we're going to add our chard, cooking for just another one to two minutes until the chard is nice and wilted. Lightly sprinkling with kosher salt is going to help draw out excess moisture, which again is the enemy of the freezer. Once the chard is about halved in volume, we're going to give it one last seasoning with kosher salt, freshly ground black pepper. We're also going to squeeze a clove or two of garlic in there and saute that around for about 30 seconds until nice and fragrant. Then a great way to cool off most of these ingredients is to spread them out thinly on a rimmed baking sheet, maximizing their surface area and steam output, which again, steam, moisture, moisture bad. For the protein, I'm just going to do some of this fully cooked, commercially available chicken and garlic sausage, sliced into nice, thin, bite-sized pieces for easy biteability. Then, just like with the breakfast sandwiches, we're going to put together a sort of assembly station. All of our intended fillings and 
including some grated Gruyere cheese, all located in one place easy to grab so you don't forget nothing. And at last, it's time for assembly, and just like with the sandwiches, we want to try to insulate the tortilla from its moist fillings. So, layer of cheese, layer of eggs, layer of our fully cooked, commercially available garlic chicken sausage, a layer of our onion, chard, and garlic mixture, and one last insulative layer of cheese. Then it's time to wrap this guy up. You might have noticed that I put all the fillings in the lower quadrant of the burrito, so I can fold the bottom over it, followed by the sides, and then roll it up like a, I don't know, like a like a burrito. Wrap it up tight, and there you have it, ready for the freezer. Rinse and repeat with the remaining Ritos. And then the freezer prep is very much the same as the sandwiches. We want to wrap it in either plastic wrap or parchment paper. Jess was filming on B-cam at the time and thought that this angle was really funny. She is a big fan of framing humor. Anywho, plastic wrap or parchment paper followed by aluminum foil. Label with its contents, the date it was packaged, your full name, and social security number, and pop in the freezer once again for up to two months. Microwaving or baking the same as the sandwiches, but maybe a little bit longer since these guys are thick. Next up for lunch, how about some soul-nurturing chicken noodle soup? Starting with about eight boneless, skinless chicken thighs that I'm going to remove any fat and gristle from and cut them into bite-sized pieces. Then for onions, carrots, and celery, I'm using store-bought frozen vegetables, which were blast-frozen commercially at the peak of freshness, so they're going to be better for a freezer soup. For flavor bonus points, you can add things like fresh chopped parsley, a whole lot of freshly chopped dill, which I think is an absolute necessity, one large parsnip finely chopped, which I think brings a nice sweetness and earthiness to chicken noodle soup, and some fresh chopped fennel stalks. Then we're going to go ahead and mix everybody together to make our sort of frozen soup vegetable blend, to which I'm also going to add three large cloves of finely chopped garlic, as well as a few inches of freshly grated ginger. Adding these to the vegetables at this stage is going to ensure that they're evenly distributed throughout the mix. Make sure that everybody's good and mixed up, and then it's time to start discussing the actual soup element of this soup. Now, in an ideal world, you've got a whole bunch of frozen, pre-portioned homemade chicken stock. The stuff I have here is pretty concentrated, so about two cups worth is going to be perfect when delivered diluted with two cups of water. But you could also use store-bought chicken stock or a couple of bouillon cubes. Either way, your soup base is headed into a large zip-top freezer bag, followed by about two thighs worth of our chopped chicken thighs, and several healthy scoops of our frozen vegetable and fresh herb medley. This can, of course, be seasoned to taste when it's cooked, but it doesn't hurt to add a pinch of kosher salt and a few twists of freshly ground black pepper. Last up, the noodles, and you can just add any kind of pasta you want in the last 10 minutes of cooking when you actually make the soup, but if you're making it for somebody else, like I am, I'm going to put the pasta in a separate bag, along with the following instructions. Put everything in a pot, except for the pasta, add two cups of water, simmer for 45 minutes, adding the pasta in the last 10 minutes of cooking, and bang, fully from scratch, chicken noodle soup. Now all there is left to do is rinse and repeat with the remaining bags and put them in the freezer, again for up to two to three months. Next up for dinner, we got lasagna. So we're going to start by making ourselves a very standard Italian-American ragu. One large, finely chopped onion gets sautéed in about two two tablespoons of olive oil in a large Dutch oven, about three to five minutes until it is nicely sweated. Then we're adding two carrots and two ribs of celery, finely chopped, and saute those for eight to ten minutes until they're real nice and soft and starting to caramelize. Then we're squeezing in, I'm going to go with like six cloves of garlic. I don't think you can overdo garlic in a red sauce. You will notice that I scooted the vegetables to the outside of the pan so the garlic gets some direct contact with the heat. That's getting sautéed for 30 seconds before we add about a half a cup of tomato paste. Sautéing that for an additional two to three minutes until it starts to stick to the bottom of the pan and then deglazing with about a cup of red wine. I know that this is normally sacrilege to put in tomato sauce, but remember I said Italian-American. I'm also going to add a tablespoon of oregano and three 28 ounce cans of whole San Marzano tomatoes, which you can either crush by hand before dumping or mash up using a potato masher. I'm also going to add one cup of water and maybe half a cup of freshly chopped basil and parsley. Then this guy's getting cooked for anywhere from one to four hours. Bring it to a simmer, keep it partially covered, drop the heat all the way down to low, and let this guy go until it tastes sweet and balanced and, well, like tomato sauce. Oop, almost forgot. If you've got an extra Parmesan cheese rind hanging out, go ahead and dump that in there. Once your sauce is simmered to saucy perfection, it's time to retrieve that Parmesan cheese rind and season to taste with kosher salt and freshly ground black pepper. Once it is seasoned to your liking, a way to cool it down quickly, just like everything else, is to spread it out on a rimmed baking sheet. It should be almost completely cool in like 20 minutes. This is way too much sauce for our lasagnas, so I'm going to bag up a couple quarts of this stuff for just sauce's sake. You want to make pasta?
pasta, boom, homemade sauce at the ready. Spread it out nice and flat, get all the air out, and freeze for up to three months. Now back to lasagna making. You could just stack in no boil noodles, but if you got traditional noodles, go ahead and cook them for about five, six minutes so that they are really quite al dente. Then I'm gonna toss them together with a little bit of olive oil on a rimmed baking sheet so that they don't stick together. And just like everything else, let them cool completely before stacking. Lastly, I'm gonna make some of these Italian sausage lasagnas. So I'm going to squeeze out maybe a pound's worth of Italian sausage out of their casings, mash them up and saute them until browned and cooked through, and drain them on paper towels to absorb any excess oil and, of course, to let them cool completely. Once everybody's cooled off at long last, it is time to assemble. I've got some disposable aluminum baking trays here that I think are gonna be perfect for two, let's be realistic, one person. Starting by spreading an even layer of sauce on the bottom so that the noodles do not stick and burn, then dropping down a layer of noodles, a layer of low moisture mozzarella, and optionally our Italian sausage. And I'm adding a lot more sauce than I think I need. Frozen lasagna has a tendency to dry out and this is gonna help combat that. Then I'm finishing things off with just mozzarella on top of the noodles and a grating of Parmesan cheese. This is gonna give us a nice crispy cheesy layer on top. Then we're wrapping everything as tightly as we can in aluminium foil and freezing once again for up to three months. Reheating by baking at 350 degrees Fahrenheit for anywhere from 70 to 90 minutes if straight from the freezer and anywhere from 45 to 60 minutes if thawed overnight in the fridge beforehand. Just make sure to tent the foil a bit when you bake it so the cheese doesn't stick. And that's it folks, some quick, easy, and convenient freezer meals. Thank you again to Bright Sellers for sponsoring this episode. I look forward to receiving my bottles every month because I can always try something new. I also love that each box comes with a wine education card for each bottle that explains the wine's origins, flavor notes, and pairing suggestions. You'll always have a good wine on hand and you can rate each bottle you receive so that your next box is even more suited to your tastes. After a long day of making frozen meals, I've been enjoying this Sabilia, which is a Syrah blend, particularly because it pairs nicely with evenings on the patio. This Cabernet blend from Mojave Rain pairs nicely with weeknight wind downs, which I think my new parent friends are going to need. So this is one of the bottles they'll be getting along with their food. Bright Sellers is offering you 50% off your first six bottle box plus a bonus bottle. That's seven bottles total. Follow the link in the video description to take the quiz and get started.